on this first Sunday of Advent and of the new liturgical year, we are given this cosmic tableau reminding us that Advent operates on two levels. The immediate preparation in time and then that with regard to the end of time which happens to us at our death. And both in the Epistle and in the Gospel we are invited not to be stuck to the ground. St. Paul gives us a very modern list of what can stick us to the ground. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lust, not in quarrelling and jealousy. We can add to that the plethora of things which are fairly new in time and which are now endemic, notably distraction. The Lord in another place talks about the cares of life, people being strangled, as it were, by the thorns. Now they will be in our time those thorns, those strangling elements of our day, which if we're not careful, can exclude what is more important. It's in your pocket. But then, the other bit, to look upwards, we are told when these things happen, to raise our gaze and the Lord is coming. When these things begin to happen, the Lord tells us, stand up straight, homo erectus. The Lord right now is warning what matters and what matters less. The man who is inclined to the material is, as it were, bent in double, walking with his head to the ground. We are called to be looking upwards. Remember that on a starry night, look upwards into the cosmos. When you look at a star, you're looking at time which has gone by, because it takes light years to get to you, it's light. In that context, over this period it is well to make a good confession, and for that I want to share with you a few things which I picked up, which somebody gave me, which I found helpful. Things which are never handled. Because it's easy to get the grace of the sacrament of confession, but not the spiritual profit that it might contain. That there should be some kind of progress and change. These are some thoughts given by St. Francis de Sales, who of course knew what he was talking about, doctor of the church and the great director of souls. Now, things which we need to look at, all of us, when it comes to our preparing for confession and therefore for the encounter with the Lord. Pride. The saint writes, all the saints, and in particular the king of saints and his mother, have always honoured and cherished this precious virtue more than any other among all the moral virtues. There was a mystic in the Middle Ages who had this word from the Lord, Purity draws my eyes, humility draws my eyes and heart. The Lord favours the humble, the little. So that's a fundamental one, which if it's not handled, will get us into spiritual and actually even human trouble. I remember hearing this some years ago, when on retreat, it was somebody who happened to be from another place, another country, but he was talking about a priest that I knew in that other country. A very good priest, very faithful, brilliant scholar, but this other priest, maybe he shouldn't have said it, but he said it, and I just repeat it because it's something which, in a way, can show what can happen. Not to judge that priest in any way, but just to indicate there can be all the ingredients, but he did add this, he has a personality problem. 
Now, those problems come out in, for instance, talking over others, talking a lot, invading others, not approaching them from below, but from above. Watch that. The quality of your communications. The, hum the humble soul, at the end of conversation, will have learned something. The soul that knows everything would have been pleased to teach the world something, but he knows no more at the end of the conversation than when it started. And he goes into the teaching of St. Augustine. Among all the falls of sinners, none is so great as that of the proud. Now just remember that Satan fell from a combination of pride and jealousy. We are participating in his fall by those two falls. And then manifestations of pride. Taking credit for anything without reference to God. Now the Blessed Virgin, who was humility itself, recognised, recognised, my soul magnifies the Lord. The Almighty has done great things. Now, she recognised, holy is his name. She didn't stop at what we might stop, how great I am. And another one linked with it, envy, when others get the credit. It goes on to give that gospel of the man who has a barn ever full and sufficient. He says to his soul, relax. And then, of course, his voice comes, you fool. This night, your soul will be required of you. And the Lord concludes, so it is, but the man who is rich for this world, but is not rich for eternity. Another one he brings out, which needs to be handled in confession, because it's very frequent even among pious Catholics. Never speak of God or devotion in a routine or thoughtless manner, but always with attention and reverence. In short, speak about your God as you would someone you truly love and honour. It should cause us a little pain when we hear something like, hmm, now this is interesting, Jesus is my homeboy. Now, just remember, we're handling the Almighty, and we need to have a language which accords with that. And a fortiori, anything which is bringing God into the conversation to underline a point, O oh God, or even worse, well, be careful, because there, that is being written on our copybook. And if it's not handled in this world, it will be in the next. Rash judgment. Now, St. Francis de Sales makes the point that the word rash isn't really necessary because all man's judgments are rash. They are not, he says, the judges of one another. And when they pass judgment on others, they usurp the office of our Lord. You may be wondering if you can ever judge your neighbour. He responds, no, never. When we are required to judge because we are in a position of authority, then we must strive to pass along God's judgment without distorting it with our own ideas and passions. So he goes into that one with some detail, different categories of that thought. One would be playing the philosopher. Many men make a habit of rash judgment merely because they like to play the philosopher and probe into men's moods and morals as a way of showing their own keen intelligence. Slander. Now, be careful. That's what happens in gossip, which is actually worse than mere gossip. It's actually false. Slander is falsely imputing sin to another. 
This sin is doubly bad because it is an offence against truth and it robs another of their good name. Actually, that is in canon law. And it's bad if in church life bad reports are given unjustly. It's not bad. We have a right to our good name. He goes on. Beware of falsely imputing crimes and sins to your neighbour, revealing his secret sins. Now, as I think we've been taught that in France, actually. A secret is not something that one whispers in a concealed voice to everyone. A secret is a secret. And if we betray it, we're not safe persons. We can't be counted on. Some people just can't keep a secret. We have to be careful what we do with the knowledge that we have. Exaggerating, he goes on, those that are manifest, putting an evil interpretation on his good works, denying the good that you know belongs to someone, maliciously concealing it or lessening it by words. Isn't it true that an interesting conversation has to be full of bad news? Failure to be faithful to little tasks. Now, this is kind of important. Anything from the way we drive a car to our duty in life professionally, we do well what we have to do. I was just in the post office the other day, and the girl in the post office was very quick. And at the end of the process, I said, everyone is competent in his sector. And she smiled. We have to be experts at what we are. And that doesn't mean we're experts at what everyone else is. There are some people who want to be experts in everything. They are heavy. But we need to be competent and do well that one thing that is part of providence. The Lord put us somewhere to do something well. Newman has a meditation on that. Something that no one else has to do. Do that and do it in all fidelity. But do it also in a mode which doesn't eliminate God. The same act can be done well or noisily, stressfully or calmly. It's the whole secret of the monastic manual work ethos. One does something simple, repetitive, but in a different mode interiorly. Keep all your actions in harmony with the one you're doing them for, with a good intention. And failure to preserve a just and reasonable mind. Here he provides literally of little ways in which we are unjust and unreasonable to our neighbour. Examples. We condemn every little thing in our neighbour and excuse ourselves of important things. We want to sell very dearly and to buy at bargain prices. We like to have things we say taken in good part, but we are tender and touchy about what others say. A touchy person, you have to walk on eggshells in that person's presence. It's heavy going. In general, we prefer the rich to the poor, even though they are neither of better condition nor as virtuous. We even prefer those who are better dressed. Now that's something in Ireland we need to be careful of, e.g. with the travelling community. I found quite often that there are hidden treasures in unexpected corners, but as people have everything, a posh and all that goes with it are completely contaminated by indirect forms of spiritual pride. Quite often, not always, but it can be the case. Because in society, one is used to being respected. Failure to resist small temptations. Now be careful, because small temptations can be just there before you, where you park your eyes. Now, <laughs> he goes on, it is easy enough to refrain from murder, 
but extremely difficult to restrain all the little angry feelings for which occasions are offered at every moment. It goes on to explain the difference between those that we think that we're observing and those that we're letting pass before our eyes all the time. This is the last Sunday of the month of November. If we have good confessions and live at them well, we should be ready when the time comes. December the 8th at 2 a.m. This came from purgatory on the Immaculate Conception, which by the way we'll have here, I presume, at 1 o'clock as on a Sunday when it comes, it's not far away. We'll also have midnight mass, by the way, at midnight bang on here. Alas! How many lives appear to be packed with good works? Lives that at death will be devoid of them. Because all these things that are good in appearance, all these glorious acts, all this seemingly irreproachable behavior, all this was not done for Jesus alone. They wanted to appear, to shine, to pass an exact observer of the rule for a regular religious. That was the sole driving force of many in existence. And in the other life, where we are, what disappointment. If only you knew how few people act for God alone, carry out all the actions for God alone. Alas, at death, when one is no longer blindfolded, what regrets people prepare for themselves. Alas, if people but spare the thought sometimes about eternity. What is life? Compared with this day, which will know no evening for the elect, with this evening, which will know no day for the damned. We love everything on earth, said the souls in purgatory. We become attached, here we are, nosewood bound, attached to everything except the one who should alone have our affection and who has refused it. The Jesus of the tabernacle waits for souls who love him and finds none. There's hardly one in a thousand, she says from purgatory, that loves him as he should be loved. Now, I want to, before I conclude, I have a few questions here which are interesting. Now this is going back to the 1800s, just remember the context, but the answer comes back. Are many Protestants saved? Now, this interests me because I know how they operate having been there. One loves God with what one has. So we have no right as Catholics to judge our brethren. Be careful, thinking yourself spiritually superior. The answer from purgatory, there are through God's gracious mercy, a certain number of Protestants who are saved, but their purgatory is lengthy and in many cases rigorous. It's true, notice this bit, that they haven't abused graces like many Catholics. Now that's an issue. We abuse divine grace. Familiarity breeds contempt. Oh, I'll go to confession about it. I'll carry on sinning in the meantime. But it's also true that they haven't had the singular graces of the sacraments and the other aids of the true religion. The result being that the expiation is protracted at length in purgatory. She doesn't mention this, but also there's the fact that they're not prayed for after death. Now, here, do you in purgatory know about the persecution that is being directed against the church? Do you know when it will end? We know that around this time, the Freemasons Masons were really operative in France, and we know also that there was direct collusion with Satan. I mentioned before, I think, to some of you here, how a Dominican got permission to infiltrate to see what was going on. He was at the session one day with the Freemasons, 
And his friend next to him said to him in his ear, Serish, it's him. And by that he meant Lucifer, the person who had just come in, sitting before them, telling them what to do next, was Lucifer disguised as a man. So they had angelic intelligence telling them step by step what to do. Does that ring a bell? We know, says the soul in purgatory, that the church is being persecuted and we're praying for her triumph. But when is it to be? I've no idea. Maybe some souls know this one is in ignorance. It's impossible for me to explain to you how it is that we no longer see the world as you do. This can't be understood before the soul has left the body. Because once that has happened, the world that is just left behind by abandoning its body to it, no longer seems to it as anything more than a dot. Compared with the endless horizons of eternity that open out before it. And I finish with this because it's linked with the fact that if we do things for Jesus, we will have the attitude of Jesus before other human beings. Jesus Artem Tachebat. Jesus before Pilate, his inferior, was silent. No notice, it says, that so from purgatory should be taken of considerations such as what will people say? True merit for a soul doesn't consist in receiving with patience reproaches that it to some extent deserves, but in receiving what it doesn't deserve, especially when she has done everything in her power to do what she is accused of as best she could. So that should give us serenity. Nothing should ruffle our feathers. Why? We can see a bit further than the person who is aggressing us. Remember that before answering immediately. You lose merit, or you'll gain it, or your reaction to something said just like that, unjustly. Let things pass. Life is too short. There are more important things. <laughs>